Good morning and welcome to the CABE webinar Wednesday. Today we're looking at weaving the golden thread with CABE Head of Technical Insight, Hal Davis. All high risk buildings in England must now have a safety case supported by the golden thread of information. The building, the information that allows the accountable person to understand the building and the steps they need to take to keep both the building and the people who live and work in it safe. Uh, both now and in the future, so this webinar will outline what the golden thread of information is and what information accountable persons need to hold to assure themselves that building is safe. My name's Shanika and I'm the Training and Learning Coordinator here at CAVE and I'll be acting as moderator for this morning session. We strive to create interactive webinars so we do encourage you to submit any questions you may have during the session. These questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We'll get through as many as possible but if we do run out of time we'll collect any questions and send out the answers in due course. You can also contact us on webinars at cbuilde.com. If you're watching us live today, you can use the side panel to send in your questions. Alternatively, you can get in touch with us via the social links now on screen. So let me introduce today's webinar speaker, Hal Davis, um, CAVE's Head of Technical Insight. Hal is an independent expert in building safety regulation and building performance. In recent years, his work has focused particularly on building regulations and building safety reform, construction, product testing, certification and regulation. He has also worked extensively on ventilation and health risks in buildings and on net zero buildings. He has been closely involved in the development of the new building safety regime and is practically implementation leading the working group that developed the recent CLC guidance on the golden thread. So if you give me a couple of seconds, I'll just hand over to Hal and he'll begin shortly. Hal, I'll stop sharing and you'll be able to share your screen. Thank you very much, Shanika. That's a, a very generous introduction, which might be paraphrased that Hal's very good at being in the wrong place at the wrong time and not working <laughs> quickly enough. Um, but um, so... I have spent rather more of the last seven years than um, anybody would like um, dealing with building safety issues. Um, and one reason for that is that I was appointed to the Building Regulations Advisory Committee um, in May of 2017. And then, of course, in June 2017, the Grenfell Tower fire occurred. And because I was new to the committee and therefore not um, involved in any of its discussions uh, prior to Grenfell, um, I was one, or, one of four who um, didn't have any baggage. Um, and um, I got roped in very quickly um, to, to the work uh, that, that was uh, then started. Um, and that's what I've spent the last seven and a half years doing for a lot of my time. So what I do want to do today is to share some of that with you. I would like to think that by the end of this morning, you'll have a, a good understanding of the Building Safety Act and the regulations about keeping and providing information. Um, and also a little bit of a wider view of the Act, because... Um, it is it is a broad act. It, it covers every aspect of building work. Um, and indeed, it covers all buildings. It seems to be a common misconception that because it came about as a result of Grenfell Tower, um, it's all about high rise blocks of flats. Um, nothing could be further from the truth, really. Uh, it's about all buildings uh, that um, are subject to regulated building work. Um, of whatever size and height. Now, the focus is on higher risk buildings. There are more rigorous requirements for higher risk buildings, but the rest um, are also um, involved in the changes. And I particularly want to, uh, to finish with an understanding of safety cases and safety case reports and how the golden thread contributes to their preparation. Um, and also talk a bit about how the golden thread gets maintained. But I do want to give a little bit of background relatively quickly, but I think it's important. So a couple of opening comments. Um, we do face unprecedented change and uncertainty uh, around the, the Building Safety Act. It's the biggest upheaval and the biggest reform of building safety legislation, I would say, since the Second World War. 
Um, now, I haven't been around all that time, but I've been around for a good chunk of it, and I don't think we've seen anything like this. Um, it's not the only thing going on. We've also got initiatives around digitalization, modularization, offsite fabrication, um, even greater use of timber and construction. They've all been government priorities. Um, we've got the Climate Change Act, which is driving um, further changes to Part L, Part F, and the new Part O and Part S. Um, I hope people are aware that there was a recent consultation on what was called the future homes and the future building standards, which are likely to lead to further changes to Part L and Part O at least. Um, and um, I, uh, this is a piece of trivia. It was World Toilet Day yesterday. Um, and at the beginning of October, our newest building regulation came into force, Part T. Um, and uh, that requires non new non-domestic buildings and non-domestic buildings undergoing refurbishment um, where the toilets are affected to have single sex toilets. So there's a lot going on alongside building safety reform. Um, and we're expected to be good at multitasking and coping with it all. So where are we now? Well, I want to take us back um, a few years. And some of you may recall this gentleman uh, the late Donald Rumsfeld, who was um, Secretary of State for uh, Defence in the United States, and um, he came out with this comment, there are known knowns, the things we know we know. There are known unknowns, the things that we know we don't know. And there are also unknown unknowns, the things we don't know we don't know. And I think an analysis of where we are on the Building Safety Act falls quite neatly into Rumsfeld's um, three categories. So I'm going to start with the easy bit, which is what do we know that we do know? Well, we do know it's complicated. There are a lot of moving parts. Uh, and if you're thinking, gosh, there's a lot to this, good, because actually if it, people who think this is simple aren't going to get it very easily. Um, we know, so yeah, so it's complicated. Um, we also need to be very clear that Sir Martin Morbick in his final report, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but I want to start with this. The deaths that occurred in Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June, 2017, and in two instances um, after that day, the deaths that occurred were all avoidable. His words in the summary um, statement about the report when it was launched on the or published on the 4th of September. And I put that slide up because I think we do need to remember very clearly we're doing this because 72 people died avoidably. And whenever people are faced with new regulations asking them to do things they haven't done before, it's human nature to ask, why have we got to do with this, do this? Why have they, whoever they are, changed the rules? Um, this is a load of extra bureaucracy. It's, we're all tempted to do it. And it's worth reminding ourselves, we're doing this because the old regime allowed 72 people to die avoidably. And we want to reduce the risk of that ever happening again. And I say reduce the risk of that ever happening again, because it's easy to slip into um, media soundbite and say, this is to ensure that nothing like Grenfell can ever happen again. Well, I'm very sorry, but none of us on earth has the power to ensure it doesn't happen again. We do have the power to do everything that we're able to do to reduce the risk of it happening again. And that is an important distinction. Um, but it's I, I, I do want everybody to be clear, we're doing this for that very reason, to reduce risks. And not because civil servants decided they'd give the industry more things to do, or because people decided, oh, let, let's create more bureaucracy. No, it's to create a safer built environment in which people can go to bed at night um, with a reasonable degree of confidence that they are sleeping in a safe place. I'm sure we all think that we 
do that. I hope we all think we could do that. And for anyone who doesn't, perhaps that's because you're in a building that has been um, found in the aftermath of Grenfell to have defects that need remedying. And this regime is about getting them remedied and getting them kept remedied. So excuse me taking a minute or two on that, but I think it's really important that we, we don't lose sight of why we are doing this uh, in the first place. In the aftermath of Grenfell, Dame Judith Hackett issued uh, her review of in, uh, her independent review of building regulations and fire safety, and she found four key things underpinning the failures: ignorance and misunderstanding of regulations and guidance, people who forget that the approved documents are guidance. It's the regulations that tell us what we have to do. Be that the technical regulations in um, Schedule One of the building regs, parts A to now T or the procedural regulations. It's the regulations we have to follow. The approved documents are guidance, and guidance for common building types, I should say. Um, I, I don't think anybody who knows me will be surprised if I say, I'm not convinced that a 50-storey tower block is a common building type. So I'm not convinced you can rely on the approved documents for them. But we might come back to that later. Um, indifference to quality and safety and a focus on speed and cost, a lack of clarity about roles and responsibilities and accountability. We'll come on to that in spades in a bit. And inadequate regulatory oversight. And again, we'll pick up on that. So um, government accepted all of Dame Judith's findings. They've passed the Building Safety Act. They've established the new Building Safety Regulator. And again, this is for all building work not just higher risk buildings. Uh, and if anybody's not clear on higher risk buildings, I will just cover the definition very briefly in a minute. They've implemented statutory regulation of building control. Inspectors, apologies. Um, there is a typo in inspectors. I didn't inspect it carefully enough. Uh, we'll get that corrected. Um, I know this has been a very challenging time for building control inspectors. Um, and I hope people in the industry recognise that um, building inspectors are now registered with the building safety regulator. They work under more stringent um, requirements and a code of, of conduct. Uh, and that new system is just beginning to bed down. We have a new competence framework for all the industry. And again, I, all is in block capitals for a reason. We need to stress that the competence requirements are for everybody, not just people working on HRBs. We've got the definition, which I'll run through in a minute, and we've got more stringent procedures for higher risk building work. So that's building work in a higher risk building. And that includes robust control of the whole process and particularly of product substitution and changes to the approved design. And um, now, it's an offence to undertake building work in a higher risk building without approval, unless it's an emergency. There's a new operational regime for higher risk buildings in use, and that's where the golden thread and safety cases come in. And there's a new regime for construction, product safety and approval, but I'm not going to dwell on that today. The big piece of legislation is the Building Safety Act, supported by the Fire Safety Act, and a number of sets of regulations. Um, and that last one is the Building Regulations Amendment England um, regulations that were introduced in 2023 and came into force on the 1st of October last year. And those regulations include the new competence regs, which run to about nine pages. Um, and if anybody is not familiar with the competence regulations, um, I would really encourage you to book yourself two hours, download the latest version of the building regs from the legislation.gov website where they are available free of charge. And you can get the latest version with all the amendments inserted 
and read through part 2A and see what the competence requirements are. If you're a client, they apply to you. If you're a designer, they apply to you. If you're a contractor, they apply to you. If you're a building inspector, they apply to all the people working on the buildings you're inspecting. Um, and they probably apply, well, they don't, pro they apply to manufacturers and anybody working on a building. Uh, key thing for manufacturers is if they start getting involved in designing parts of a building, they're a designer. There's a clear definition of designer in there. So um, there are all the regs. People sometimes ask, why have we got so many sets of regulations? Why can't we have it all in one place? And the answer to that is um, we could. There is a serious flaw to that model. If you put it all in one place, you're putting it all in an act. You can only change acts of parliament by further acts of parliament. And that is difficult to do. The Building Act 1984, heavily amended by the Building Safety Act. And one reason for that is that there were lots of things that had got out of date between 1984 when it was passed and about 20. 19, 2020, when the Building Safety Act was being drafted, they didn't get changed because it was too difficult. Regulations are much easier to change. They may need a vote in, in the Houses of Parliament, but they are much easier to change and they need far less parliamentary time uh, to, to change. So uh, that's why we have lots of regulations. It's a more flexible and adaptable system. Um, we now have the Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 2 report, and we have Sir Martin Morbick and the panel's recommendations. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But moving on, what do we know that we don't know? Well, we have Sir Martin Morbick's report and we have the recommendations. And we know that Sir Martin recommended a number of things. Um, there, are a, there are 56 recommendations. Um, half, 26 of them relate to construction, 28 of them relate to fire and rescue, and two of them are revisiting his recommendations on emergency evacuation arrangements for those who cannot evacuate using stairs. And I will just say I have deliberately avoided making any reference to numbers of staircases or to vulnerable people or disabled people. It's about how you get everybody out of a building, including those who can't use stairs. And there are other categories of people who might struggle with stairs. Older people, um, pregnant women. Uh, those nursing young children or caring for, for very young children who might be fine on two flights of stairs, but they're on the 10th story of an HRB. So they may now have to get down 20 flights of stairs. Um, that may be more challenging. So um, he he has introduced, he, he's reintroduced uh, that discussion and, and it's going to need covering. Um, his recommendations also cover the structure of building control, the regulation and training of both fire engineers and risk assessors, the sign off of fire strategies for HRBs by regulated fire engineers and by nobody else. Um, there are machinery of government changes, for example, a single regulator, the regulator being responsible for all construction product testing and certification. Uh, they are things well outside of today's scope, but it's worth your while being aware of them. There are um, things in there about licensing contractors and about architects training. There is a lot there. But in terms of um, what happens next, well, we have the report. The Prime Minister, when he spoke in the House of Commons on the day that the report was published, committed government to respond within six months, which takes us roughly to the end of February. And um, the simple answer is we have no idea what further change the government will propose in response to Grenfell. So we know they've got to respond. We don't yet know how they will respond. I will make an observation, which is that... If they, are, if they are not going to do what Sir Martin has recommended, they will need a good story to tell to justify that, given 
the politics and the understandable depth of feeling um, amongst those who uh, have suffered a great deal as a result of Grenfell Tower. Um, so it, to pick on one recommendation, regulating fire engineers. I really struggle to even begin to think of how a minister would stand up in the House and explain why they're not going to do that. And dare I say, it might not stop at fire engineers, but we, we don't know, we will have to see. And then, of course, there are the unknown unknowns, and I've summarised them on this next slide. Moving on to the headline issues, um, we've got major areas of change. So the scale and scope of change is unprecedented, as I mentioned earlier. It's the whole industry. It's all controlled building work. It's everyone doing building work. It creates two new regulators. It's a really big deal. It creates a new system for the regulation of high risk buildings in occupation. It creates new duty holders for high risk buildings in occupation, in particular, the accountable person. But when we're building or working on those higher risk buildings or any other, we've got new duty holders in, in clients, in designers, in contractors. And we have a new principal duty holder, uh, a principal designer and principal contractor on projects. Um, if it's a domestic project, um, then um, it's likely to be a single um, entity doing the work and they are deemed to be the principal contractor and principal designer unless other arrangements are explicitly made. Um, and domestic clients don't have the same duties as non-domestic clients. We have a new role and regulated status for building control inspectors. They are a regulatory body. They're there to regulate the, re the legislation. They are not advisors. And I question whether the wider industry understands this. Um, I might be so bold as to say, I don't think a lot of the wider industry does understand this. No longer can you expect building control to turn up and tell you how to do something you don't know how to do. And to be blunt, I'd be wary of even asking the question because it might trigger the thought in building control inspectors' minds, is this individual or their company actually competent to be doing what they're doing. Now, they may not follow that up at the first instance, but if they then start looking at the work and thinking, I'm really beginning to wonder whether they're competent, they have got every legitimate reason and they have the legal powers to start asking you in detail, why do you think you're competent to do this work? Can you show me the evidence that you're competent to do this work? Their expectation is that designers and contractors are competent, therefore they know what the regulations require, and therefore they will be able to present the inspector with clear evidence that the design they are presenting or the work that they are asking to be signed off is compliant, and they can explain why they think it's compliant. And if you can't provide that evidence, you're going to have a problem. Um, I know we, we, we've got used to having the inspector turns up, they have a look round, they can't find anything the matter, and they sign it off. And the widespread view is that means it's compliant. No, it doesn't. It means the inspector didn't find the non-compliances and therefore had no legitimate reason not to sign the certificate. It's now going to be much more challenging to get um, inspectors to sign certificates because they are going to ask questions. And I don't think they will just be about fire escapes and sprinklers. I think they, they, they will expect to cover a, a wider range of things. So there will also be a new approach to competence. There will be an expectation that people demonstrate in managing it, particularly on higher risk buildings, where when you make an application for approval of building work, you will be expected to provide a competence declaration. What do you have to put in that? Um, well, I'm going to add to, to your recommended reading list the Higher Risk Buildings Procedures Regulations. Um, regulation 4 is tells you all the information you have to provide when you make an application. And Schedule 1 explains what a competence declaration looks like. 
And I'll, I'll tell you for free now, without you looking up, if you think it's everybody working on the project will be competent, um, that isn't going to wash. And if you put that in, you'll get your application sent back and asked to complete it properly. Um, I'm not making that one up, by the way. The regulator has been sending back applications with that one liner in. Go look at Schedule 1 of those regs, the high risk buildings procedures regs. That explains what a competence declaration looks like in more detail. New duties to cooperate and to plan, monitor and manage. And they apply to clients too. There's also a requirement for clients to provide building information as soon as is reasonably possible. There's a thought. Um, so, you know, these are now statutory duties. And again, if inspectors turn up on a site and things have gone wrong and somebody says, oh, well, I couldn't do that because he wouldn't give me the information or she wouldn't cooperate with me. Ah, thank you. So you haven't complied with the building regs on this project. Now I'm going to try and get to the bottom and see why not and what we're going to do about it. Um, so people need to be a, need to be clear on that there's as i say a new process for applying for approval um, and changes to the use of building notices you can't use building notices on hrbs end of um, a new regulatory regime led by the building safety regulator with the regulator as the building control authority for hrbs and a new regulator for construction products I've touched on this already. We now have building control as a regulated profession. And those of you who are building inspectors will know this far better than me and with some feeling because of uh, what's um, what you've had to do over the last 18 months. Um, that is a big change. And um, it's worth saying that it's worth saying that I've managed to put this slide in twice. So my apologies, but what, what I have done on this slide is to emphasise the new system for regulation of higher risk buildings. Um, and in fact, that's why I've put it in twice, because I do want to move on now to higher risk buildings um, and into safety cases and the golden thread. So higher risk buildings. Dame Judith... Um, was very concerned at the way in which higher risk buildings were treated in a very fragmented way. And she wanted them seen as a single system. Now, it's worth remembering, she by training is a chemical engineer and nobody in their right minds would try to manage a chemical plant or a chemi yeah, chemical plant in the way that we, man we, we manage many of our buildings. Um, where the, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing very often. And I think she found this a real shock. Uh, and so she recommended that we should create, provide and make available key information and that clients, designers and contractors should be involved in doing that throughout the life of a higher risk building. So if you live in a block of flats, however old it is, the people who are managing it should fully understand the building you're living in and be able to explain it to you. And not just up until completion. So during the planning, the design and construction um, of higher risk buildings, or indeed during the design and construction of, of refurbishment of existing higher risk buildings, um, there are procedures which are hard stops. For the new builds, they're the gateways, Planning Gateway 1, which is a planning gateway, the clue is in the name, Gateway 2 at design and Gateway 3 for construction. And these are hard stops or possibly hard starts. You cannot start work on an HRB or on refurbishment of an HRB until you have got the design of that work approved by the regulator. It's an offence to start. There is an exception for emergency works on an HRB, but having done the emergency works, you have then got to submit a retrospective approval to regularise, and you've got to explain why you think it was a genuine emergency and why you are not just using that regulation as a loophole to getting your work approved before you do it. And it won't create a fait accompli. 
if the regulator doesn't like what's been done, they will require it to be put right, which may mean doing the work twice. Um, and yes, that does mean that things like replacing fire doors in HRBs are having to go through the regulator for approval because fire doors are part of the fire compartmentation um, and indeed the failure of fire doors and door closers contributed to the spread of smoke at Grenfell, which in turn contributed to some of those avoidable deaths. That's why we're being so fussy about fire doors in HRBs because if they don't work and there's a fire, um, people may die. And we're about reducing the risk of that happening. Um, information needs to be made available to residents in occupation, setting out how the building they live in is being kept safe. And again, oh, you know, that's more work to, well, yeah, it is. But would you be happy living in an HRB and not having information about how it's being managed and kept safe? I, I wouldn't. And I, I wouldn't want anybody in my family having to live in one of them. And the golden thread is the information that underpins this new regime. And it's the foundation of a system that involves all residents in the building. And that's regardless of tenure. So it's um, tenants, it's leaseholders, it's freeholders. Um, it's, um, and, it, and it involves landlords and building owners um, regardless. And it's about making residents safe and showing them why they're safe. Now, I do need to run through what a higher risk building is very quickly. So it is a building in England, and it's only England, that is at least 18 metres in height or has at least seven storeys. And um, it must also be of a description specified in regulations made by the Secretary of State. And those regulations are the higher risk buildings, descriptions and supplementary provisions regulations. And they define three types of building as higher risk buildings. A building which contains at least two residential units, a care home, a hospital. Now, it's important. They have to meet the height criteria and be of the, um, of the described type. So whenever you're building a residential building that meets the height threshold, more than two units, it's an HRB. A care home meets the height threshold, it's an HRB in construction, and the same a hospital. However, when the hospital or the care home is completed, they cease to be a higher risk building because they are already regulated under workplace regulations and the health and social care regulations. And adding a third regulatory regime serves no purpose. However, when that care home or hospital needs further building work done on it, it's building work. It's a building that meets the description of an HRB when building work is being undertaken. So it's higher risk building work. So it has to go through the regulator. However, hospitals and care homes don't need the golden thread. It's only higher risk residential buildings that need the golden thread. And in occupation, they have an accountable person who is responsible for the building usually the freeholder, and the accountable person has a duty to identify, eliminate, or mitigate, and manage building safety risks in their building throughout its operation and occupation, to inform residents about the safety arrangements in the building, and to maintain the golden thread of information to enable safe operation and management. So that's higher risk buildings. Um, for anybody involved in buildings in Wales, the Welsh Government is planning to consult on how it will implement the Building Safety Act in Wales. Um, the last I heard, they were thinking of making any building with one residential unit an HRB. They only have 187 HRBs in Wales. Um, so it's quite a, a different exercise. In England, it's about 12,500. Um, but if anybody is working in Wales, then 
be be alert. There is a consultation coming and the association will be um, making members aware of that um, when it comes out and we will be looking to to respond. Uh, and again, the regime in Scotland is different again. So the golden thread, um, it's required by the primary legislation. It's in sections 33 and 88 of the Act. And I, I have this slide in here so that if somebody is asked awkward questions, where does this come from? There are the answers. You can go looking in the Act and then the detailed requirements um, are in, they're in regulations. Um, so the method of measurement um, of HRBs is in one set of regs. The detailed information requirements are in um, the procedure regs and in the higher risk buildings, keeping and provision of information, etc. England regs. Um, and there's also some industry guidance, which I'll come to in a minute. And again, as I said earlier, by doing it this way, with the headline powers in the Act and the detail in the regulations, it is going to be more straightforward to, um, to update and amend if required. Uh, and it's also worth noting that the golden thread must be stored electronically. Now, this slide just gives a quick summary of the various new regulations to implement the Act. So HRBs are defined by the higher risk buildings, descriptions and supplementary provisions regulations. Um, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but there is already a debate about the question of the status of roof gardens. Um, if anybody's got a particular question on that, please put it in the chat. And it's one that I might suggest that we pick up that I pick up afterwards um, that there is a little bit of a question mark about what the regulations say what the government guidance says but in general the how to measure um, an HRB is there then if it's an HRB you have to register it and you have to provide key building information you then have to develop your golden thread and I'm going to go into detail on that in a minute and you have to have a safety case Putting all of that into slightly simpler everyday language, how do you measure it and work out whether it's an HRB? And if it is, therefore, you have to register it. How do you do that? What information do you provide initially? What further information do you provide to back that up within 28 days? And then what do you need in your golden thread? And how do you manage the HRB and, and safety risks? So that's the full regulatory package for HRBs in occupation. Moving on to the golden thread, it's the information that allows you to understand the building and the steps needed to keep both the building and the people in it safe now and in the future. And that's predominantly the people living in it, but actually it's anybody who has reason to be in the building, visiting, working, whatever. It's giving the right people the right information at the right time to keep buildings safe. Now, that's clearly the people who manage the building, but there's also an element of keeping residents informed. Um, one of the largest causes of fires in residential buildings, and indeed in some other buildings at the moment, um, is um, lithium ion batteries on electric bikes and electric scooters. Now, accountable persons are going to have to tackle that, which might mean that they um, provide somewhere for the storage of electric bikes and scooters and for the charging of electric bikes and scooters, where if there is a fire, it can be contained and doesn't spread into um, common areas that are a means of escape. That means telling the residents what those arrangements are and clearly asking them to follow them, explaining why they've been put in place for the resident's safety, and perhaps explaining that if people do insist on leaving their electric bike in a fire escape, the building management may well remove it because it's a hazard to everybody else in the building. Now, I appreciate there's a whole load of stuff there. How do you deal with your residents? How do you do that in a, in a diplomatic and constructive way that will foster 
um, their cooperation, but that's the kind of information that may need to be provided to residents. Um, and how do you deliver accurate information about the building, use that information to support other duty holders? You, you've got somebody coming in to do some work. You've got a lift maintenance contractor who needs to come in once a month to carry out certain checks. Now, that maintenance is not building work. Um, and if all they're doing is working on the lift system, that's never been building work. The Building Safety Act hasn't turned it into building work. But they need to have certain information about the building. They need to record what they've done. They need to record it accurately. And they need to provide that information back to the accountable person so that if, for example, they've noted that a component on the lift needs replacing at the next visit, that's been recorded and that actually gets carried through and done. Um, so it, you know, it's not just a static, here's a snapshot of how the building was 18 months ago at practical completion. It's this is the state of the building now. And this is how we're keeping it up to date. And the Golden Thread is very much not a product or a software solution. At one time, there were lots of software suppliers who I think thought that the Golden Thread um, was their license to print money or print software licenses. Yes, you need software. Yes, you need to keep the uh, Golden Thread electronically. But you need to work out what you do first and then ask what software do we need to support that and that might be we've got existing systems how can they support it and that's really important to accountable persons um, the golden thread regulations are not a blank check for them to go out and spend money on software and stick it on the service charge they will have to justify that so it's the information that allows accountable persons to understand their buildings. It's giving people the right information at the right time. And it's a process. It's not a software solution. At the design stage, it's the information that demonstrates that if you build the building, it will comply with building regs. In construction, it's the information and evidence that the approved design is actually being built or where it's not being built as designed, that the change control procedures that were approved are being followed and changes are being recorded. And in, in the case of a major change, a change to the com fire compartmentation, for example, that you've gone back to the regulator and got that change approved before implementing it. Um, at completion, it's the evidence that what's been built is what was designed subject to changes and it's the comprehensive and accurate electronic record for transfer to the accountable person. In occupation it's an accurate and up-to-date electronic record of the asset as it's being managed, maintained, repaired, refurbished, altered, extended to support the accountable persons in managing the building safely. So the idea that you go to an accountable person and ask them a question about an element of their HRB, um, I don't know, we'll have to get somebody in to investigate, is simply not an acceptable answer. We need to go and look that up in the golden thread. Give me five minutes. That's the sort of answer that's going to be expected. Um, so that that's how it works through life. In design and construction, it should inform the development of documents for the Gateway 2 submission. It should inform the development of information during construction through to completion and what's presented when the completion certificate application goes in. And it should demonstrate how planning conditions have been met. It records and justifies controlled changes. It records any mandatory occurrences. So, for example, it's an HRB it's going to need lifts. So it's going to have a lift core. Um, and the lift core needs some openings in it into which the lift landing doors can be installed. The lift landing doors will uh, have um, fire safety certification and there will be tolerances for the size of the gap between the lift landing door set and the perimeter of the lift landing opening in the structure. There'll also be a requirement for the materials used in the opening 
in, in, in the uh, wall in which the opening is made because they have to be fire resisting. And there is what's commonly called in the construction sector a cock up and the lift landing door opening is too big. And when the lift landing doors that have been included in the design are installed, there will be too big a gap for their certification. So there is now a problem. Additional fire stopping is needed. That is a, a fault that affects the fire safety of the building. It's a mandatory occurrence. It has to be reported to the regulator as the building control authority for that building. We've made the lift landing door hole too large. Was it just one or is it the whole lift core? And the regulator is going to ask some questions. First of all, it's a, it's a change to the compartmentation. So they're almost certain to require an application for a change to the design to be approved, setting out how that cock up is going to be corrected. And they're going to need to approve it. And that may take weeks. And you can't carry on work until that's sorted out. Lift cores are on the critical path. That's going to be a big deal. Um, it's a mandatory occurrence. It's got to go to the regulator. The regulator is going to ask, so how did that happen? Because surely your um, construction control plan identified that getting that hole the right size was important. So how did it go wrong? How did your construction control processes fail to get that right? And what are you going to do about it? Um, we'd like to see a revised construction control plan, please. They might even ask, um, we'd like to understand how the supervision of that work went went on because it hasn't been effective. Um, what are you doing about that? They might even ask, well, whoever did that isn't competent, are they? So can we have another look at your competence declaration? And if that bit doesn't work, where else might there be competence? So it could become a really big deal if you have mandatory occurrences. Um, and the key thing is that the golden thread enables a demonstration of functional compliance with all applicable building regulations. That's not just Schedule 1, that's all the other ones like testing and commissioning. What use is a smoke extract ventilation system if it hasn't been tested and commissioned properly? No use whatsoever. In fact, worse than useless because you're relying on having it and you don't even know whether it'll work. Um, have you have you got the fire safety information that's required um, under the golden thread? That's a regulator. So all of this is part of the, the handover and completion process. And then we get to occupation and I'm nearly there. Um, the golden thread will enable the accountable person to identify building safety risks affecting fire and structure. And as I, as I as my earlier example showed, that includes the risks of things like e-bikes and e-scooters coming into the building and being left in places where if they burst into flames, it's going to be a fire problem. Um, and it will include any you know, bin stores. What's the risk of an arsonist being able to set fire to a bin store, for example? What can you do to mitigate or manage that risk? If you can find a way of eliminating it, unless the arsonist lives in the building and therefore has access to the bin store, um, it's those sorts of things. You know, clarifying what you're doing about each of the risks to, to manage, mitigate, reduce. And then you justify why you've taken that approach rather than another one. Um, you know, the, the way to eliminate the risk of e-bikes and e-scooters is to ban them from the building. Is that practicable? Is it even legal um, when you look at the leaseholders' uh, leases? Um, so there, there are things to think about. You'll be pleased to know there is some guidance. Um, the Construction Leadership Council published this at the end of August. 
I will own up to helping by chairing the group that put it together. And we had input from the building safety regulator, from what was um, the Department of Leveling Up when we started, and it had become the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government by the end, um, and the Department of Business and Trade, which supports the Construction Leadership Council. It was written by the industry for the industry. And for those who are not familiar with it, please go and download it from the Construction Leadership Council website. And anybody using it, if you have constructive feedback, please use the link in there to provide it. Moving to my last couple of, uh, of serious slides, um, there is a requirement for a safety case report and Section 85 of the Building Safety Act sets out the requirements. Anybody managing an HRB needs to be developing their safety case report now. It will take five years for them all to be called in by the regulator to be reviewed and building assessment certificates issued. But if something goes wrong in your building, if there is a mandatory occurrence that you have to report, they may ask to see your safety case. Or sorry, your safety case report. There is guidance from the regulator uh, and it's in that document. Um, there is a focus on fire and structure and on potential harmful events that could lead to um, significant failure and have the potential to cause uh, loss of life. And as I say, the safety case will be used to prepare a safety case report showing how the accountable person believes they're operating the building safely. The requirements for those reports are in the Management of Safety Risks regs. There is also a whole load of new guidance information in the UK BIM framework, which is also available online. Um, and there is talk of a new information management initiative from government. Um, and there is something, it used to be called the UK BIM Alliance, which was really good because you knew what it did. And they've now rebranded themselves as NEMA. Um, you'll sense I'm not a huge fan of some um, marketing uh, arrangements. Um, in NEMA, it's the building, it's the BIM Alliance um, by a new name. The guidance framework is really useful. It gives you access to the standards and guidance on information management uh, that will help people to get to grips with the golden thread. So it, the golden thread is going to fundamentally change how HRBs are designed, built and managed in occupation. All high risk buildings need to have a safety case report to demonstrate that the accountable person understands the risks and is taking all reasonable measures to remove, mitigate, manage them. The accountable person must have accurate building information in the golden thread. And of course, many people will be involved in developing and assuring information. They will be involved in doing work. Many others will use the information. There is a duty to cooperate to maintain that information in an accurate form and it's got to be stored electronically and accessibly and securely. The Golden Thread is there to deliver fundamental reform in the way we operate our occupied higher risk building stock so as to reduce the risk as far as we can that we ever see anything like the Grenfell Tower fire again. Thank you very much for listening. And I think we're now going to turn and take some questions. And Shanika, do you want me to leave that slide up or to stop sharing? Um, you can leave that slide up. I will leave that slide up. Okay, so we do have quite a few questions here. So one from Rob Hanley. Do you have a view on what can be considered emergency repairs to HRBs? Um, I think the simple answer is um, where there is a clear immediate danger to some or many residents that needs emergency repair. So there's been a party on a Saturday night and a fire door has got damaged and is no longer fit for purpose. If there is a fire in the apartment um, to which it uh, allows access, smoke is going to be able to escape into the common areas and affect means of escape. I think that is undoubtedly an emergency. 
get it fixed. Um, it's also a security issue for the residents. Um, so it needs to be fixed. Um, somebody wants to change their fire door uh, because they don't like it and they want a fire door of a different colour and they're prepared to spend the money on having it done properly. Go through the process. That is not an emergency. Um, does does that are people in danger if we don't get this emergency dealt with now that's i think that's the crunch question and i'm i'm also fairly confident that will be the way the regulator will look at it and they will probably ask the supplementary is somebody using the emergency provision to try and game or bypass the system um. Um, is there still a place for the building notice route? It seems to me and many others that it has run its course, particularly for DIY, as there are many horror stories horror stories from that. So is there a, still a place for the building notice route? Right. I'm going to give two answers. One is a statement of fact, which is that building notices are still allowed by law for certain works and they can be used. They have no place on HRBs. Um, then they're not permitted. Um, I have a view um, which is that um, given the current capacity of the building control system, I think there is an argument for the responsible use of initial notices for smaller projects, particularly domestic projects. If everything had to go through a full application we simply don't have enough building inspectors right now and i believe what would happen would be that the less responsible would simply say stuff it i'm not waiting i'm just going to do it anyway and without building notices we wouldn't even have the information about where they were doing stuff i know there's unregulated stuff that is done unlawfully without even a notice and building control don't know about it unless there are complaints about the work and they think hang on a minute there's no record of this um, or worse still something goes wrong now if something goes wrong and um the rules haven't been followed um the the bsr is now the regulator they can go and track back and investigate and start asking questions it may only be a two-story um, building but the fact that somebody has seen fit to remove internal walls that mean that the building no longer complies with part a indeed it might even be immediately dangerous um the fact that that has happened raises all sorts of breaches of the building regs, which the regulator now has full powers to go in and investigate and prosecute if if they see fit. Um, so I've extended the answer a bit. I do. Initial notices are still legal. I think there is a place for them. I think if we were to do, I don't think if we were to do away with them now, the system would grind to a halt. And I think public interest would not be served by doing that at this time but it's doubtless an issue that will be kept under review i i hope that's helpful thank you i realize we've run out of time we still have 12 questions left do you want to take another question and get the rest um emailed over to you shanika i'm happy to take as many as you want um and to provide um answers to the rest um afterwards and I, my apologies to people who have to slip away to an 11 o'clock. I will do one more and then I'll send you the rest, I think. Very good. Um, do we need to take a competency assessment from the specialist contractors like facade contractors and terrace, uh, terrace repair contractors? Um, I would say you might need to um to ask them to demonstrate why they are competent um people ask is there a, is there a template the simple answer is no there isn't because it depends what job you're doing and if you've got a job that you know is quite 
tricky and um and need specialist skills you need to really probe how a potential contractor convinces you that they have the skills the knowledge the experience and that they will demonstrate the necessary behavior which is if they hit a problem instead of trying bluntly to bodge it and cover it up they will say, hang on a minute, there is a problem here. Um, we, we need to stop while the, the whole team agrees how we're going to fix this problem in an appropriate way that is compliant with the regs. So it's skills, knowledge, experience, behaviour. And on simple jobs, that will be a simple set of questions. On complex jobs, it will need more. And the, the regulator is not going to provide us with a, a, an easy template or checklist because their view is you've got to stop and ask what are the competences needed for this particular job? Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you very much. We do have quite a few questions, so I'll email you after with them and hopefully I can send them out in due course. Um, just want to thank you, Hal, for the presentation and thank everyone who has joined us this morning. Just to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be uploaded to our Cave YouTube channel very soon, which can be shared with your colleagues. With that, I'll wrap up and I hope to see you again next month. Um, if you do have any questions that weren't answered today, um, you can also send them at webinars at cbuilde.com to get in touch. Thank you very much.